Good morning. Why don't we start? Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Feng Ming Spring Kong. She's a professor at the Department of uh, uh, Radiation Oncology at MCG. Now it's a Georgia Region University. And she, uh, she plays major roles in NRG and a founding board member of Central. It's a network between the Chinese and American radiation oncology communities. And Dr. Uh, Curran invited her, and he was supposed to introduce her this morning, but he was called upon an emergency meeting, so he had to go out of town. So I have a big shoes to fill. <laughs> and um, she um, has uh, like 48 pages of a CV. I'm just going to skip through and just uh, this, uh, introduce the highlights. Um, she received medical degree from Fudan University, Shanghai, uh, and PhD uh, from the same place. And uh, she did the residency in radiation oncology in a cancer hospital, Shanghai Medical University. And she uh, came to Duke University for research postdoctoral fellowship for five years. And then she went back to the clinic and did the internship in general surgery at the University of Vermont. And um, <coughs> she did uh, another radi radiation oncology residency at the Washington University Medical Center in St. Louis. And she was certified radiation oncology ADR and ADMS in 2000, sorry. Uh, 2003, she was recruited as an assistant professor of radiation oncology at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And four years later, she became associate professor. Uh, 2013, she was recruited to uh, Georgia Region University in Augusta as a uh, full professor. And um, she was uh, the chair, also chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology um, from 2013 to 2015. And she was also the resident program director at the same time. Okay, and then um, uh, she uh, led numerous clinical trials, especially in RTOG and now energy, and she has 115 publications. And she's the member of an editorial board of three journals, Frontiers in Thoracic uh, Oncology, Journal of Radiation Oncology, and the highlight is Journal of Clinical Oncology. And she has uh, a few grants listed there, but especially she has uh, Auto One as, a, as the principal investigator for past uh, several years, uh, functional image and molecular uh, markers to individualize adaptive uh, radiation therapy. And also she has a uh, U, U01 uh, pending. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Hans, uh, Dr. Shen, for a uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, Wally, who happened to be emergency uh, trip to Dallas for money. So, <coughs> but uh, thank you for coming early morning. This is really early. Normally, I'm still in bed. I do not get up so early. So. But uh, it's really my pleasure to share with my journey of uh, research in function imaging and the blood marker <coughs> during last decade. <coughs> Sorry. The question is, are we going to make a difference? Are we making a difference? I think it's really good time for lung doctors more than a, in nowadays. You know, surgeon can pay uh, minimally invasive procedure, radiation oncologists can play ACRP for early stage, 
stage two, three, we all play together, multimodality here. Stage four, I think the most fun oncology right now is medical oncology with genomic testing, molecule testing, personalized care. Now, while I'm speaking, so I want to ask you, how many of you are medical oncologists here? Wow, impressive. So you have more fun than us. The challenge is in molecular testing, however, your molecule is based on tissue. Tissue is the issue. Tissue is invasive. Biopsy is not that easy. Tumor heterogeneity is, is an issue. Treatment response monitoring is nearly impossible, and repeat biopsy is not a clinical principle. For radiation oncology, radiation treatment tissue is a real issue. The only thing we have is really just imaging and the blood or, you know, oscillator. So I'm a radiation oncologist, as you know. Uh, don't get bored with us. We'll have uh, some fun stuff as well. We have a lot of technology, or imaging guided, 3D conformal radiation technology, intensity modulated radiation therapy, 4D motion controlled radiation therapy, stereotech body radiation therapy, and uh, imaging guided radiation therapies. You know, we call 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D. We can ask the name MD. But we. In the clinic, however, we only have one plan, one field, and the one dose regimen. We have a lot of technology. This just show you a history part of a traditional treatment of 2D. That's one box. One box from radiation start to the end, six week treatment for motor for uh, advanced stage cancer. Right now, the box is not that big, a little bit smaller, but still one box. The current practice of radiation dose is relatively uniform. As you know, we did a, uh, a survey of 850 radiation oncology around the world a couple years ago. And if you, you, you know, you survey now, right now, it's even more consistent. Most of people, majority radiation oncology prescribe 60, 70 gray. Right now, almost uniformly 60 gray. But then we know that, however, after this treatment, you know, 90% of them have ultimately ultimate local failure, even the most recent Wallis uh, study have about half of them have local failure. It, it is truly one dose fits all, you know. As we all know, patients are different, tumor are different, we look at the imaging from one patient to another, and the most importantly, tumor and normal tissue response are very different. How do we identify those differences. So we normally just ignore it. Traditionally, we look the treatment response at the end of the treatment. We don't care in the middle of treatment. Uh, when the patient asks you, doctor, what do you think my tumor response is? Oh, I'm sure, I don't know. We test the response three months later. We believe tumor will shrink. That's the traditional method. And there's been a lot of studies, particularly talk about function imaging for PET CT. Uh, we know that post-treatment CT response is our current standard. Post-treatment PET response, so dozen multiple dozen of publications showing the post-treatment PET response is associated with the pathology response. Uh, maybe predictive pattern of failure, post-treatment response, uh, post-treatment PET response is predictive long-term survival. Post-treatment response actually was considered to be the most significant factor in predicting long-term survival. Uh, most of the study come from uh, Pete Mack in Australia. But there's a problem for post-treatment when as soon as the radiation gave into the patient, you can never get it back. If the treatment already finished, the post-treatment response, so who cares? You cannot do anything any, uh, anymore. So we were, not, we were interested more than something we can actually using that information to adapt to personalized treatment. So that study started when I just started Michigan Korea more than 10 years ago, and uh, we, the first hypothesis was radiation treatment response and long-term outcome maybe predict the early course of the treatment before radiation is completed. If so, then you may be able to personalize the remaining treatment. This is a, a general study design. That's the design uh, we put together years ago. And we think tumor and normal tissue function may be assessed in the middle of the treatment 
by test FTT pan and ventilation provision stack uh, and the method of treatment. And we think the metal response may be correlated with post-treatment response. The first question came up when I designed this study, some people say you're crazy. NCI recommendation still online available 2016. No, no, no. You cannot do the PET scan until treatment completed. At least eight to at least six to eight weeks after completion of radiation. They said no. And I talked to Ted Lawrence, who is my dear mentor. I said, Ted, is that crazy? He said, mm, you can try. Nothing to try. So I'm very grateful to him. So we tried. We first did a pilot study that was, uh, I thought it was at the beginning of my uh, PET study. Um, uh, uh, luckily, ASCO gave me a little award to do, do that. Very expensive, $5,000 each case. So we did 15 cases and see if a PET can actually uh, perform in the middle of treatment because we worry about inflammation. And I look at the literature, as a matter of fact, uh, the inflammation is uh, the publication they used was actually only based on three patients and the lymphoma case. The inflammation more on the post, not in the during, but the NCI was making recommendation based on the case report and cannot do it uh, afterward. So we did the, uh, the 15 patients and uh, we'll look at the, the post treatment, uh, the treatment related inflammation, as a matter of fact, is more at the post at the three months and minimally visible during treatment. So it's very opposite to what we uh, believed. And, uh, and at the same time, I, we try to compare to, at the same time, we actually uh, look at the animal study. What is there after radiation? We did not see too much inflammation there. We saw more necrotic cells uh, than inflammation in the, uh, uh, during the fractionary treatment. Later, we also look at the during treatment versus post-treatment. You know, the, the during treatment are very much similar to post-treatment. This during is after middle, uh, you know, it's a middle weight treatment, about 40 gray. And then the bad responders during treatment are uh, also the bad, you know, those are worst patient after treatment. So then we generate uh, a little bit more ambitious hypothesis. Well, look like there was some correlation from the, uh, during to post. Then can we really predict the long-term tumor control and overall survival? Uh, if so, can we design another study to actually personalize treatment? So similarly, we did a FTT pan in the middle of a treatment, about 40 to 40, 50 gray, around 45 gray. And uh, we assessed treatment response, long-term tumor control, and survival after treatment. Here with more patients. Right now, uh, up to now, the study is still ongoing, about 150 some patients enrolled. Uh, this is about uh, 88 patients, similar to what we observed in 15 patients. The maximum tumor activity, tumor volume, all decrease in the middle of treatment, and they are really, in a way, uh, correlated with post-treatment. We also see the uh, activity was actually associated with the progression-free survival. And the, the TOG, total lesion glycosis, which is a product of the mean activity and tumor volume, is highly predictor of the survival. Most interestingly, we found that the traditional belief that activity was not as important as the volume-related factor. And the volume-related factor, the TOG, volume-active related TOG, and also metabolic tumor volume are the most important significant factors. So we uh, also look at the during assess the during treatment volume factor are actually the most significant factor for survival. Very recently, we were very excited about the film hundreds of patients of a tumor shape. We have a, in a very intelligent uh, uh, postdoc working on the shape of the tumor. And uh, as you can see that, long-term survival on the left side and the short-term survival is on the right side. The tumor shape seems like a very different. This is going to be presented in AATM this year. And there are some people doing textures. We are doing as well. We did not find the same. Uh, uh, the preliminary result is not as exciting as shape. <coughs> One striking find during this ob careful observation is actually uh, the, the pad change and tumor volume change seems like a little bit more 
the uh, CT change, the green or the CT change in the middle of the purple or the PET. Uh, about PET CT, uh, PET change is about 20% more reduction than CT change. Because the change are differential from PET and CT and the, and the change in the metal treatment, the next question is, well, it looks like during change you can predict something. Can we use this information to do uh, so a person, to personalize treatment for the adaptive treatment for the metal, you know, for the remaining treatment? So this came out, uh, the next study is uh, called using FDG PET applied during treatment to personalize adaptive dose escalation in uh, advanced non small cell. So we gave, in this trial, we gave first 50 grade based on pre-treatment PET CT volume. And then we sim re-simulate patient, re -PET scan, and uh, give the remaining treatment to as high dose as possible to over up to 86 grade, which is biology equivalent in two grade fraction over 92 grade. And the plane was adapted individually to each patient each two months. Here is the dose prescription here. The adaptive treatment, we gave pre-treatment CT PTV, PTV planning target volume 50 gray at least, CTV 60 gray, and during treatment CT uh, PTV 70 gray, and the residual active most resistant tumor as high as possible go to up to 86 gray. And this is very different for the uniform one dose 60 gray, the current standard the NCCM is stationed right now. And please notice that the during, you know, the dose was de-escalated. The pre-treatment CTV was de-escalated 50 gray instead of a traditional 60 gray. And the, the most importantly, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, most importantly, the, the during treatment resistant CTV was escalated. Here, just to show you some examples, this is a dentist who failed a soil economy. And uh, you see that on the top panel is pre-treatment, and the bottom panel is during treatment. If we use the pre-treatment CT, PET, CT, this plane, uh, we limit lung toxicity to 17.2%. 17 we can only give up a 70 gray. But uh, we're using the during treatment to guide our planning we can give this patient 86 gray. That's what those two got. He, is, uh, he was in oxygen when he came up, up to me, and uh, he is alive and uh, tumor-free more, more than five years. And this is just a different view for you to see the differences of the tumor on the pre and during. This is a, a sagittal view. We also see uh, every individual patient, patient is, uh, is learning for us, everybody, because everybody behave differently. This is number one page. The first patient in our study I want to show you. This patient, unfortunately, did not change that much in the, in during treatment. However, the tumor continued to shrink even after 15 months after completion of the treatment. She unfortunately failed brain, brain mass, not local. So this study was mature. On the uh, enrolled 42 patient, where toxicity was acceptable. The trial reached the goal of a 20% local regional tumor control. Um, we actually have 28% upstream tumor. Um, this uh, long-term survival was also uh, better compa compared to our historical control. This is just show you local regional control um, uh, from uh, 28% tumor. There was also a significant improvement of uh, uh, local regional progression-free survival, progression-free survival, as well as overall survival. But this is a historical control. You have to keep in mind. We also look into the um, uh, local control, so-called local control, in failed tumor failure. In this time, we, uh, two years was 18%. Two patients fell locally in radiated area, but two patients fell regionally, non-radiated, isolated, no regional failure. So this is compared very favorably to RTG617 and, uh, and uh, also the JCO, recent JCO publication, the preclaimed study local infield failure. So this is exciting. Wally was really, uh, have to have been kind of years ago, even we have not had the preliminary result, but he was excited and uh, help us support and uh, help us kick out the multi-center uh, study is RTG1106. 
2007. This is a randomized study. We're going to compare the, in the uh, individualized adaptive treatment with the 60 gray uniform treatment. Um, the, we not only doing the PET, we also uh, was able to secure funding to the hypothesis scan from Ephraim. Uh, at least, unfortunately, uh, recently shut down because uh, uh, Cardinal Health is not making any more. Anyway, we learned a lot. So this is, uh, is uh, um, I think uh, this is a very important study to my personal bias. This is good start UG study applied individualized dose prescription to isotoxicity. So uh, actually, 15% uh, of the normal lung toxicity. And the first multicenter study required PET scan for every patient for individualized training. It's the, also the multi-center uh, first try to use PET guided part of PET guided adaptive training. The first RTOG study demands all the modern technology at this stage. And the RTOG 617, we did not do that. The other study is still ongoing, not do that. Luckily, it's going forward. We enrolled 96 patients already. The interim result was recently done. And, uh, they cannot share with me, but uh, they did smile on me. I did not acquire on me, so I, I'm happy because often most of the study after interim analysis uh, we shut down or, you know, uh, we uh, put on hold. So it was not a put on hold. It was moving forward. That's, that's plus. <coughs> so the one thing we have to keep in mind, the local problem is not the only problem. We have medical oncologists here. After experience this study, I have more patient fail distantly than ever. And uh, two-thirds of our failure are associated with distant side. And uh, our chemotherapy, you know that, except for the target therapy, you only have a, most of the uh, regimen, you only have a 30% response rate. But this time, we use carbotaxel, and it was obviously did not provide the best treatment result. So my colleague, uh, Ms. Chen, uh, where uh, years ago, I said, how can we improve systemic therapy? I said, why don't we do target therapy system? I said, great, great idea. Let's do it. So I wrote the protocol before I left the Michigan, and the Greg took this off, get the funding from pharmaceutical company, and uh, it's kicking off this study. We call, instead of part personalized adapt, pet adapter radiation therapy, we want integrate systemic target therapy called PARTIC. And, uh, uh, you know, hopefully if Emily or any of you are interested, uh, we can join this. It's going to be a hard study, but uh, it would be really nice to, to get rid of a cytotoxic treatment combine modern type radiation with target modern uh, uh, target therapy. Well, this one, actually, the study, just one sentence I would say, which is uh, uh, no chemotherapy, personalized adaptive radiation therapy, plus, uh, you know, driving motor mutation guided target therapies. If EGFR positive, placebo. If ALK positive, chrysotinine. Uh, 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 So, middle treatment PET scan, we can conclude in a good confidence that will likely make a difference in tumor control in patients with local advanced non small cell lung cancer. With the integration with the effective systemic therapy, we have good hope that we can improve survival significantly. And I'm looking into at least 15% survival improvement. Not only tumor. Normal tissue also change. How, what happened to the normal tissue? I'm just showing you one example. If you don't look, you don't know. But if you look at like this patient from 44 day, 40, 39 day to 42 day of treatment, you see what's a big difference there. The lung extended. And sometimes lung you know, collapse. It could happen too. So far, I have not seen collapse in metal, but I see pneumonia happen. So we also need to look at the normal tissue. How do we look at the normal tissue? And at least hypothesis, we hypothesize that a lung function can, uh, can change globally and also regionally in the middle of treatment. And those changes may be correlated with long-term toxicity. Radiation pneumonitis, it's a dose-limiting uh, toxicity. So if we know the toxicity in the middle of treatment, we can also, based on the toxicity, to personalize treatment. Similar design. We acquired a, a function test in the middle of treatment, function test low globally, and the function test regionally use ventilation profusion scan you use just for the PE test. And then we look at tox post treatment toxicity after treatment. First, look at the global function change. You look at that. FEV1, FVC doesn't change that much, in the, you know, 
but the DOCO changed remarkably in the middle of treatment, you know, from four weeks into treatment to post-treatment. Patient changed differently. 47% of patient remain minimum, remain stable with minimum change. 20% patient improved. 30% uh, patient decreased significantly. And the change differently from side to side, of course, like episode lateral have a lot of change, contralateral minimum. And the change of lung function change will depend on the tumor size, tumor location. So this top panel, look at, is, uh, look at the, the top panel, just look at the central tumor, the arrow showing the, uh, left, showing the color, uh, dysfunctional lung pre-treatment and um, during treatment it re-expanded. And the peripheral lung, the tumor doesn't, uh, even though tumor may shrink, but doesn't cause them a change in the middle of treatment. Change of difference also based on the base lung function. The green dots are the dead lung. The red dots are the healthy lung. You know, after treatment, you know, the, the dead lung cannot dead again. They are still dead. It doesn't change that much. This is ventilation similar. You know, ventilation function did not change that much for the bad lung. But it is really complicated looking into lung function for the patient, lung cancer patient. I'm not going to screw that, just give you a little bit uh, taste of what we're doing. That's a multiple uh, project ongoing, but the lung, you know, the lung could look normal on your CT, but it would have totally different function. And those functions change also based on uh, the underlying physiology. Some of them get worse during treatment, some of them getting better, and uh, you have to know which one is going to get worse and better, then can use those information to help you to personalize treatment. The way we use this function lung chain, lung, uh, to uh, personalize our treatment is just give you a simple example of on the left side. If you don't know the function, the white area or the functional area, you, without seeing them, you, you based on the CT, you give higher dose radiation to the white area. But now with IMRT, intensity module radiation therapy, if you know which area is function, you can put at least as a void instructor. You know, you can, you, although big picture, it doesn't make too much difference, but we can actually significantly decrease the radiation to the function lung, so decrease the toxicity. So that was for the lump. In, the, for the, you know, in addition to the lump, esophagus also changed in the matter of treatment. Uh, esophagus become hard, you know, patients, you know, get burned in the esophagus. A lot of people, unfortunately, interestingly, they used to come to the esophagus, oh my goodness, tumor progression, give more radiation. So that's another thing, to, uh, you know, we have to watch very carefully. Esophagus change per happen in about, oh, more than 50% patients will increase the activity in esophagus, in, in esophagus. This show you the increased activity in esophagus. Pre-treatment on the top, during treatment on the bottom, the tube become a little bit more uh, active. Similarly, if we know, um, you know, 50% patients have esophagus uh, developing toxicity, uh, developing esophagitis, if you know which patient is going to have this problem, you can actually, uh, I, you know, to avoid this active, you know, burn the esophagus, decrease to uh, decrease radiation to the esophagus. Here, you use the esophagus sparing, we can also decrease the dose to the esophagus, the decrease toxicity. So this is work ongoing, and uh, I, I don't think it, uh, it will take too much effort to prove this concept is correct. So in conclusion of a normal tissue function imaging uh, for lung, esophagus, I haven't got a chance to talk to you about heart, but it does have a chance to guide us for adaptive treatment to decrease treatment toxicity. Of course, again, randomized harm are needed. That needs to be tested. So the next thing available for radiation oncology, we don't have tissue, again. So that's a blood. I think the blood is minimally invasive. We have a dosimetry. So uh, if molecular markers in the blood can identify patients who are not responsive to radiation or high dose radiation, or identify patients at risk of treatment toxicity, 
um, the treatment plan can also be modified to decrease the toxicity and increase the tumor control to maximize the output again. My first interest was coming from the Duke study. That's why I went to Duke. You post to us about five years work like slaves in the dark in the lab. <laughs> so they looked at the TGF beta, uh, the more first study, TGF beta, free uh, bone marrow transplant patient with uh, TGF beta level was highly associated with uh, a lethal lung and uh, uh, liver toxicity. It's pretty striking, small number of patients, but it's very significant with uh, positive predicted value of 92%. So I said, TGF beta is something really cool. So I had a big interest then two years. The first two years I worked on that, find out that there are thousand samples in the blood we can discuss. Anybody interested, find out that it's all trash, garbage in, garbage out. All the sample was messed up. We did not find anything positive. But until we find out the methodology, later on we uh, find out in lung cancer, it's quite complicated as a matter of fact. Some lung cancer patients are having TG beta level high at the beginning, so we have to look at the radiation-induced change for TG beta. Those patients have toxicity, other patients who have radiation-induced elevation. And we combine TG beta with the physical model, the physical dosimetry, mean lung dose, we can really stratify the patient, stratify the risk for patient uh, for, for, them, for their risk of uh, radiation pneumonitis. If you have two risk factor, your risk are very high. If you have TG beta, high level TG beta in the middle of treatment or uh, inner treatment, um, or if you have mean lung dose are very high, uh, the patient most likely will have develop, will develop toxicity. Not only TG beta, there's many other important inflammation cytokines in the blood. So we look at if any other cytokine can help further uh, it looks like there's some potential, but at least that uh, is being sorted out. We're not going to have time to go through this. But I'm going to show you some uh, highlight, uh, the marker, the interleukin-8. When we, when we were trying to validate the important markers, uh, been reported by others like uh, IL-1, IL-6, and uh, alpha, we were not able to validate it. The only thing will come out of strikingly different is IL-8. It's anti-inflammation in patients but uh, 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 it's uh, pro-inflammatory in the animal study. You see the di difference here. The red lung of the patient have toxicity. The blue are without toxicity. The separation are, are significant. And we, TG beta and IOA were combined together, you know, combined together to see if we can further improve the, the predictive accuracy. Seems like if we combine the, uh, the uh, combine TG beta IL-8 and mean lung dose, look that we does, it did increase uh, predictive accuracy. Particularly if you do these three factors individually, if a patient have no risk factor, your risk is really low for toxicity. If it's three of them, again, uh, you can have all three factors, then you are at a significant risk of toxicity. Interesting, very encouragingly, this was just recently validated in another separate group of patients. And I'm right now in the process of getting this data validated in R2G, multi multicenter setting. Often I ask the same question. We have so many biomarkers, you know, TG beta, IL-8, uh, genomic, proteomic, everything. Then, uh, or even you do genomic, you look at the uh, geno uh, gen similar genomic um, multiple pathway, does it make a difference if you mo the more is better or more is more confusing? So we're looking at, a, actually specifically look at all thoracic toxicity. We look at the genomic testing as a first try. Uh, so is one variation, two variations, three variations make any difference at all. For this setting, you know, this is actually TG beta pathway. Even one SNP have problem, then you are at risk for other problems. You don't need all the SNP together. In one, sometimes it's enough. We also look at the biomarkers, the protein, uh, proteomics. We were able to uh, set, we were able, we were able to separate the patient for their risk of lung toxicity, and they all have uh, biology relevance to important pathway. MicroRNA is the most exciting. Recently, I know uh, Dr. Shin's lab doing a lot of work for chemosensitivity for, for microRNA. Uh, 
uh, and that we find that something interesting microns may associate with lung toxicity, or thoracic toxicity, and also uh, yeah, all, uh, other toxicities. With all these markers together, coming back, how can we really composite all the knowledge together to help us really guide the uh, clinical practice? It's confusing sometimes. I just said too much data, even though not, I have more, we have more data than patients, so difficult to guide us. So how can we find a way to, uh, to really guide your treatment? So uh, the Michigan group will collaborate, uh, you know, continue to collaborate together using a Bayesian decision network. We uh, trying to try to you know stratify, uh, you know, formulate the toxicity and treatment tumor control uh, in you know in attempt to personalize radiation dose and the, to the tumor and normal tissue. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we can use these toxicity measures to put further you know, generate a formula for tumor control, a formula for normal tissue. So you can, when patient come on, I can just press my iPhone, tell them how much dose I can give, uh, give what toxicity you have, what survival uh, chance uh, the patient will have. So uh, the example of this is not as, you know, simplify this complicated pathway. It's not so complicated as matter of fact. You can be simplified. This is using just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is from two patient data. We know patients have different risk of toxicity. We classify them for the most sensitive patient. Then you cannot use the conventional dose limit for lung. For example, you, we normally use 20 grade green line that our standard practice. For sensitive patients, you put them at the very significant risk of toxicity. For the resistant patient, you are not going to generate enough control. Patient will not have toxicity. So if you limit the 15% toxicity for, pay for, uh, for every patient, if you know what the toxicity risk you are, you can really personalize your dose prescription. So this concept was implemented in the P01 project at University of Michigan. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, the most of data, data was luckily from lung group. Lung was one of the two important uh, group. Uh, the, the P01 was funded with using, uh, using biomarker uh, for toxicity and uh, using also ventilation perfusion spec uh, for personalized adaptive training. Uh, that was the MC27 million uh, two years ago was funded, a study was kicking off. So I'm just going to spend uh, less than five minutes to talk about the last. You know, my initial interest was toxicity, but we should not ignore the tumor control for biomarker. If the biomarker associated with toxicity, not, why not for the tumor? So we look at the tumor with, uh, uh, tumor control, uh, survival. This is, we look at the microRNA, we found out we were, we were able to, using microRNA signature to separate the patient high risk, low risk for death. You know, the significance of a difference is, uh, is remarkable here for, for micro and for limited. This is a testing group of 47 patients. And this was validated in our own center, independent data say, set. Uh, so still significant variation uh, between, the sensor, uh, between the high and low risk. You could use micro RNA to separate, uh, to predict patient survival. And most interestingly, you can actually tell what patient will respond to high dose radiation. So the patient with high risk microRNA signature here may be benefited from high dose radiation, while the low risk doesn't matter. You give high dose, low dose, doesn't matter. And this is a very important for our person, future personalization. Similarly, uh, DNA repair gene pathway, we look at 86 repair gene. We can also separate uh, uh, the patient survival. Patient survival from uh, to uh, high risk, or low risk, or intermediate risk. I'm not going to go through this. It's very interesting, different from uh, microRNA changes. Uh, we found the unfavorable group actually may not benefit from radiation dose separation. So the, the, the biomarker, different biomarker tells you a different story, and you really need to understand uh, what's going on. And this is work ongoing in our lab. We want to test out if this kind of SNP in the cell actually really directly correlate with survival. 
here I'm just going to show you the example of uh, how example of using a genomic testing, a single nuclear polymorphism. This is from data from our patient, two patients. We can actually separate patient of high risk and low risk here. The blue line are the more resistant patient, the red line are the uh, more sensitive patient, the green is the average patient. You know, the, you see the significant separation here. If you use 60 gray, you actually most of the time are not as good, uh, particularly for the resistant patient. But if you give higher dose radiation, 74 gray, look at the between 70 and 80 gray, and the, you, may, you, you are too much for the, for the sensitive patient. You may overkill. You may kill patient actually from toxicity instead of uh, tumor control. This, this one just to show you that there is optimal dose for each individual patient. So forgot the bottom half. Just look on the top one. And the, the, you know, the, for the top one, for the red line, the patient, a patient with uh, you know, certain kind of technology, 60 some gray, it's a good thing. You know, it provided the best overall, best overall survival. But the, for the blue line, you need to go for 85, 90 gray to control it. So the is if is taking the technology factor into consideration. We should always think to use our modern technology. How would that improve our, how would that further personalize our treatment? I think the key issue we overlook at that with the technology is, you know, how can we maximize tumor background, tumor normal tissue dose ratio? If you can increase tumor dose ratio, you can also, as you see the bottom panel, uh, histogram, the top histogram, if you use technology more wisely, you can significantly improve survival for each individual patient. Uh, you know, uh, even you know what is the optimal dose because you decrease toxicity. We estimate if we can do that for all the patients we treated, every portion is personalized, we may improve survival up to 40%. That's very exciting. And uh, I think we do have hope to improve, you know, we do believe it is possible, actually, one blood test may guide precision personalized treatment in non-small cell lung cancer. And the validation study is needed, and uh, we have put a team together with MD Anderson and Damasco, you submitted your one, there's an indefundable score, you said, uh, you know, non-officially, you are top of four of the seven recommendable recommendations. Don't spread the word. Until you get money, you never believe money coming to you. But it's very exciting and uh, very exciting with the team. You know, we have uh, already collected, uh, pulled together about 1,000, uh, 2,000 samples, including RTOG. We're going to validate what we found for the markers more for, to, uh, local, for survival, local control, and uh, different kinds of toxicity. So I strongly believe, and I'm dedicating to it, nothing else is more important than this project, that high imaging blood marker can really guide uh, treatment guide personalized adaptive treatment to maximize therapeutic gain in each individual patient. And the w it is important, and the imaging biomarker as part of a multidisciplinary care to, you know, to really put personalized medicine into, uh, into difference. And this figure was, uh, I'm happily uh, to follow, was uh, adopted in the big data set NCI uh, landmark paper recently published. And we do need to integrate all our knowledge in imaging and biomarker, non-tissue related stuff together with multidisciplinary care. So in conclusion, our current radiation practice is a little bit one box fit all every patient. But we hope with imaging and biomarker, we can classify our patient, make a little bit difference for, classify our patient for, to further improve local control and survival and decrease toxicity. Thank you very much. This is the Sorry, forgot about the class. It's a strong team effort, and I try to put everything I thought the most important during my life, 10 years in, in 60 slides. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>